This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Bruchem Avon, welcome everyone. Thank you everyone for coming. Tonight's Shir Pasha Shlach. We're going to be speaking about a very interesting topic. And in the beginning of the Parsha, the Meraglim are headed toward Eretz Yisrael. And of course, there are 12 Meraglim. And Rashi tells us from their very onset, they went with bad intentions. And we know that eventually two of the Meraglim would not be persuaded by the other ten. And two of the Meraglim were able to sit, stay straight and not be influenced. Of course, Yehoshua ben Nun. Yehoshua ben Nun came back with a good report about Eretz Yisrael. And in fact, his Rebbe, Moshe Rabbeinu, prayed for Yehoshua that Yehoshua should not be influenced by the Meraglim. That's why his name originally was Hoshea, and his name was switched to Yehoshua. Right? Yeah, the Rizal asks... Why is he called Bin Nun? He should be called Ben Nun. Why Bin Nun? It should be Ben. Everyone else is Abraham, Ben Yitzchak. Yitzchak, right? The answer is, says Ariza, because, okay, we took the Yud. Where did we get the Yud from in Yoshua's name? We took it from Sarah. Sarah used to be Sarai. So we took the Yud from Sarah, and we borrowed it, and we put it in front of Hoshea. But where do we get the two dots from? Where do we get the two dots to put under the Yud? So that Rizal says, you take the two dots from the Ben, you take the, from the Sego, which is three dots, you take two of the dots, and you put it under the Yud. Okay. And then there was a man by the name of Kali ben Yifuna, and Kali ben Yifuna was also one of the Meraglim. And the Apostle says like this, Vayalu Negev, <coughs> the Meraglim went up into the south of Eretz Yisrael, Vayavoyad Hebron, and he came to Hebron. So if you look carefully at this Pasuk, the Pasuk makes a very quick switch. First it says, Vayalu, they went up to the south. It's talking about all the Meraglim. And then it says, Vayavay, and he came. Sounds like they didn't all go to Hebron, says Rashi. Correct. Kalev levadoi halach sham. Kalev himself went there. Vinishtateach al kivriyavais. He prostrated himself on the graves. Of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Why? What was he praying for? Shelo yehei niseis lechaverov. So he should not be persuaded by his friends. Liois ba'atzasam. To be part of their council. In other words, Kalev understood that the influence of the Meraglim would be very hard to overcome. He sensed that they were wrong. He knew they were wrong. But he also knew that he wouldn't be able to withstand the temptation of going along with the crowd. And therefore he went to Hebron to Davin at the Kever of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. So all the Meraglim go to the Negev. Only Kalev goes to the graves of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, to the Ma'ara Samach Pela. What's he doing at the grave? Says Rashi, he went to Davin. You don't Davin at a grave, you Davin in a shul. Shachris is in the Beis HaKnesses. Mincha is in the Beis HaKnesses. Marev is in the Beis HaKnesses. What's he doing in the graveyard? You don't pray in a graveyard. I mean, who's he praying to? If you want to dive into Hashem, so you dive in a shul. You go to basic first. What was he doing? He was praying to the person lying in the grave. He was praying to Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. This seems to be a fundamental flaw in Emuna. The Rambam tells us, the Rambam in his Perish HaMishnai, some Sechta Sanhedrin, tells us that the fifth principle of faith, we're familiar that the, that the Rambam set forth 13 principles of faith, that there's a creator, he guides the world, there's reward and punishment, Tyre Min HaShemayim, prophecy, Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest prophet, Mashiach, Tchias HaMesim. The Rambam writes that the fifth principle of faith, he writes, Shehu Yisbarach, Hu Haroi Laavdai. God is the only one who is fit to serve. Ula Gadla and to glorify. Ula Haidia Gdulasa and to make known his greatness. Velasos Mitzvosov. And the Rambam goes on to say that we may not serve, pray, glorify not only any object, but any mediary, any medium between us and God. In other words, let's say we would, we would want to worship a star, a planet, a person. Not that we believe that's God, but as an intermediary to God Himself. That would be a violation of the fifth principle of faith. In other words, we, as opposed to other religions, as opposed to Christianity, where they pray to mediaries, we pray only to God. In fact, the Rambam and the Yudgim Alikrim and Aishei, 
everybody knows, Ani mamin be'amuno shalema, I believe with complete faith, she'haboyre yisparach shemoy loy levadoy roy lehesvalo. That the Creator, blessed is His name, only to Him is He fit to pray. V'yein lezulasoy roy lehesvalo, it is not fit to pray to anything else. So what's Kalev doing at the grave of Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov? He's praying to them. If he would be praying to them, he would be what we call an apikoiris, a heretic. That would be a complete abandonment of Judaism. You cannot pray to anyone but God. You can't pray to a tzaddik. You can't pray to a dead person. You can't pray to an object. That is not Yahadus. That is not Judaism. So what is Kalev ben Yifune doing at the grave? You want to daven to Hashem? What, there are not enough shuls, there are not enough shtiblach? Right? That's one thing we have no shortage of, right? We have enough shuls, right? So why is Kalev going to the grave? So okay. Yeshua ben Nun, his Rebbe ready daven for him, but Kalev stuck, so Kalev has to daven for himself. Now the Ran, the Ran gives us the first insight into what is the concept of praying at a grave, and this is the most innocent of all of them, okay? The Ran, one of the great Rishinim, the Ran says like this, and we'll use the following introduction. What is the closest thing that we have in this world to the Rebbe Nishalayim? What is the closest thing we have to God? So, there's a Gemara that says, there was a man by the name of Shimon Ho'am Sunni. And Shimon Ho'am Sunni, he was a specialist. You look him up in the yellow pages, they, had a, they have a special yellow pages, a rabbi yellow pages. And different specialists, some rabbis they know Chumash, some know Mishnayis, some know Gemara. Shimon Ho'am Sunni specialized in the word S. Shimon Ho'am Sunni understood the meaning of every S in the Torah, except not eating, not Essen, S, the word S, right? Until he came to a pasuk, he had no idea what it meant. Es Hashem Elekecha Tira. Fear God. Right? It says to fear God. We all fear God. But whenever you see the word S, S always comes to include. So Shimon Hom Sunni said, Who are you supposed to fear besides God? You're not going to fear anyone except for God. So Shimon Hom Sunni then abandoned his whole career. He had a career of explaining the S's in the Torah. And when he gets to the Pasuk, Hashem Lekech Tira, he says, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm going to become an accountant or something. I cannot explain what it means, S Hashem Lekech Tira. Right? That's true. Thank you. S Hashem Lekech He could not explain what S Hashem Lekech Tira is. Until Rabbi Akiva came along and said, S Hashem Lekech Tira says, fear God and fear Talmidei Chachamim. Torah scholars. Says the Chazoynish, think about what Rabbi Kiva is saying. What Rabbi Kiva is saying is, there's something called God. What is the closest thing that we have in this world to Rebbe Shalom? Now, we may say, a tzaddik. Right? How do we picture a tzaddik? Someone who sits all day, he fasts, he prays, he dispenses advice. Tzaddik. Or a chassid. What's a chassid? A very pious a religious person. It doesn't say fear God and a tzaddik. It doesn't say fear God and a chassid. It says fear God, le rabbis tamidei chachamim. The closest thing, says the Chazay Nish, ha- that we have to the Rebbe Shalom is a Torah sage. Now, what is a Tamil chacham? What's a Tamil chacham? So the Ramah tells us, very simple, to know what Tamil chacham is. Tamil Chacham is, the Ramah, in Yeradeya Semen Reish Mem Gimel says, Yoideya Lisa Valitain Betaira. He could converse in any topic in Taira. Umevin Midaitoi Beroiv Makaimois Hatamud. He understands the Shakla Vataria, the give and take of the majority of Shas. Okay, so the Tamil Chacham is not a term just to throw around. You know, nowadays, Everybody, you know, he learns in yeshiva for one year, he's already showing a Tamil Chacham. He's a big Tamil Chacham already, right? And if you learn for two years, you're a goin. And you learn three years, right? You're the Gadol Hadar. No, no. To be called the Tamil Chacham, it's not so easy. It's a very, uh, it's a, a level that many strive for and uh, the only very few reach. So in order, the closest thing that we have in this world to the Yibbun Shalom is the Tamil Chacham. Okay, why? Because God has bestowed upon this gentleman... The Torah. So says the Ran. Think about a Tamar Chacham. This Tamar Chacham, he's like a big cup. What's in the cup? Torah. A blessing from Hashem. A bounty, a shefa. A special bestowal, a special gift from God. So if we were to be able to see 
put on our, you know, ruchniyastik glasses, our spiritual glasses, and we would see a Tamil Chacham. Let's say a Tamil Chacham would walk in the room. So we would see he would be like this purple cup, and there would be a purple ray of spirituality coming down from heaven, filling up this Tamil Chacham. So that means, says the Ran, a Tamil Chacham during his lifetime was a vessel that received Shefa Eloiki, the bounty of God. <coughs> says the Ran, that means his bones, his flesh, his blood is sanctified, is holy, is a vessel, is a vehicle with which God bestowed godliness, sanctity. Says the Ran, that means like this even after the person passed away, and his nisham is no longer in his body, his body still retains a semblance of this ability to be the vehicle with which God bestows shefa to this world. And therefore, even after the person has passed away, the location where he's buried is a holy site. It's like a shul. It's like a base medrash. It's like a base haknesses. They're different sanctified places to daven. It's like a base hamikdash. Says the Ran, you know why it is worthwhile to pray at a grave? Because if the person was a tzaddik, the person was a tzaddik, then that location is holy. It's like a base medrash. So according to the Ran, to go to a grave of a nice kosher Jew, there's no Indian. It doesn't do anything. There's no Indian to do that. It's only to go to the grave of a tzaddik. And that's it. Why? Are you praying to the tzaddik? No. That would be blasphemous. That would be heretical. Are you trying to invoke their merit? There's no such thing according to the Ran. The only concept of going to a grave is that it's a holy place. That's it. Well, look, let's take a look at the words of the Ran, the Ran inside. It says the Ran, Not only are Tamir Chachamim sanctified in their lifetime, Kigam Acharei Moisam, even after their death, Mekoymois Kavruseyen, the place of their grave, Ru'uyin Lihimatzei Hashef Hashem, Betzad Menat Shtadim. You can likely find a certain bounty from the Rebbein Shalom. Ki Atzmoseyem Asher Kfar Hoyu, because their bones that once were Kalim, vehicles and vessels, Lachal Alem Hashef Aleki, for it to devolve upon them the godly bounty, they still retain a semblance of their original sanctity. In other words, according to the Ran, a kever, a grave, is just a holy site. It's just the Makam Kadosh. You're not praying to them. You're not invoking their merit. You're not talking to them. They don't hear you. They're in the ground. They're six feet under. They don't even know you're there. It's just, it's a holy pot. It's a holy spot. That's it. Anything more than that would be a deviation from what we call mainstream Jewish thought. That is the opinion of the Ran. Okay? Is that it though? Is that it? Most people when they go to a... Good, now, I want to point out something very interesting. It comes out according to the Ran that when a tzaddik has passed away, he, since at the time he was living, his body was a vehicle to achieve a certain godliness, so even now that he's dead, the place still retains sanctity. So it would come out, is it more worthwhile to pray by a tzaddik when they're alive or when they're dead? Alive. When they're alive, of course. The Ran is saying, even after they're dead, there's still something left. But although, of course, it's much more worthwhile if you could in this world Stand next to a tzaddik and pray because you're in the, you know, if, forgive the expression, you're in the Wi-Fi zone. You're in the, you're in the, you know, you're getting primary reception in the area you're standing. So after the tzaddik has passed away, his grave is still getting signals. The signal is still there. I don't know how strong it is. You know, maybe sometimes, but it, the signal is still uh, existing. But when the tzaddik is alive, to daven in their presence, not to daven to them, to daven to Hashem in their presence, that's a very big Indian according to the Ran. Because the Ran is saying the whole point of davening at a kever is because the signal is strong. So certainly when they're alive, the signal is even stronger. And in fact, you could look it up, the Sam Sofer writes in Shulchan Aruch, in his footnotes on Shulchan Aruch and Simon Kuf Beis in Archaim, Sam Sofer says that there's a woman by the name of Chana. Chana did not have children. And she was praying in the Beis HaMikdash. What's she doing over there? She wanted to be standing in the Dalit Amos of Eli. I'll read to you the words of the, of the Chassam Seifer. Why? Says the Chassam Seifer. 
the reason why Chana did this, Shazeh Segula Nifla. It is a wondrous omen. Lehispalo Betzad Hatzadik. To daven in the presence of a tzadik. So, you know, if you go to a tzadik, and, you know, when, his, when he's, uh, his back is to you, you don't tell him, you quickly stand next to him, you offer a prayer, you know, you're in the zone, and then, even better, why go to the, why go to the basic verse? And you don't even have to wash your hands afterwards. That's it, yeah. right? Okay, so that's what it comes out according to the Ran. What? He had a question mark on him. But that's what the Ran is saying. The Ran is telling us that the only concept of praying at a grave is that it's a holy place. The Bach, look at number 10 for a moment. The Bach talks about a person who made a neder. And they made a vow. And the vow was, they promised they were going to go to the cemetery to pray. Says the Bach, if they would come to me, I would nullify the neder. You know why? Because it is usur to go to a cemetery to pray. Not only is it usur, it's an isur da'i raisa. It's a biblical prohibition. It looks like you're seeking out the dead. We know there's a pasuk in Chumash that says, Loi sidroish min amesim. You're not to seek out the dead. Says the Bach, what are you doing in the cemetery? What are you doing there? Prayer is for the shul. Learning is a base medrash. Tzedakah, there's tzedakah boxes in every store. So what are you going to the, what are you going to the cemetery for? You're going to pray? No. You're some kind of, you're a kishuf macher. You're a witchcraft. You're a sorcerer. What are you going to the cemetery? Says the Bach, if someone would make a vow that they're going to go to the cemetery of the Bay, I would nullify it. It's a love in the Torah. I, why did Kalev ben Yifune go to Kever Avais? That's because Kalev ben Yifune understood a cemetery is a holy place. But your average Jew, the Bach, has no understanding of this. And therefore the Bach says, I would tell a Jew, not only you're not allowed to go to a cemetery, but even if they made a nether that they're going to go to the cemetery, they have to abolish it. They have to nullify it. Then the Bach says, you know what? Maybe we could justify the concept of going to a cemetery in the following way. Chas v'shalom, you're not praying to the dead. Praying to the dead would be seeking out the dead. It would be like Sidro Shmin Mason. But maybe what you're doing, says the Bach, is all you're doing is you're going to Hashem and you're praying before God that Hashem should answer your tefillah in the merit of the tzaddik that rests over here. And says the Bach, many Jews are doing this, and there is some basis in the Zohar, and don't protest against anybody who does this. Is the Bach recommending that any Jew go to the cemetery? No. Is the Bach saying it's a worthwhile thing? No. Is the Bach praising, you know, if the Bach would open up the, you know, the newspapers today, where every other page is go to this graveside and that graveside, would the Bach be happy? No. The Bach is just saying, people want to do it, so let them do what they want to do. It's not the worst thing in the world. Because we could justify it. They're not praying to the dead. All they're doing is they're praying to God in the merit of the tzaddik. Now, even according to this, let's say the person wasn't an exceptional tzaddik. Would there be any reason to go? No. Not really. You're praying for God in their merit. Okay, that's assuming they have some kind of superlative merits. But if you're not confident in that, that would defeat the whole purpose. So Rabbi says, so far we've offered two reasons for praying at a gravestone. Reason number one is, it's a holy place. Reason number two is, you're praying in the merit of the tzaddik. <coughs> Let's take a look before we go on at the paiskim. Halacha lamaisa. Do the paiskim allow one to go to a grave and then pray directly to the mace, Right? By the way, you'll go to uh, grave sites all over Eretz Yisrael, you go to America, and you have people, you know, they're talking to the person who's dead. They're saying, Shalom Aleichem, Tzadik, intercede on my behalf, I need Parnasa, go to the Kisei HaKavod, be Melitz for me, pray for my daughter, pray for my son, pray for America. Right? You ever hear? People do that. Are you allowed to do that? Halach Lamaisa. Are you allowed to go to a grave and pray to the person lying in the grave. So the Berhete writes, look at number 11. What is the concept of going to a grave? The base hakvaros makom menuchas at tzadikim. A graveside is a place where the tzadikim are at peace. Umi toichkach humakom kadosh. It's a holy place. Who said that? The Ran. And then he says, 
Someone who prays at the graves of the righteous. Don't put your focus on the dead. You should ask the Rebani Shalom that Hashem shall mercy on you in the merit of the righteous who are lying in the ground. So the Berhitev is sort of merging together the two explanations we've given. The Ran says a gravesite is a holy place. The Bach brought down an opinion that when you go to a grave you pray in the merit of the Tzaddik. By the way, the Chayadam takes it even further. Chayadam writes, Simon Kuflam and Ches of Katan Hey, be very careful not to pray to the dead, because doing so is close to be do- being doyre shalames. It's like seeking out the dead. It's a lav in the Torah. So here you have a guy. He took a day off from learning. He went to the different kvarim, and he thought he had a good uh, spiritual day. Turns out he was over a lav every single kever he damned. Why? Because he didn't realize you can't pray to the dead. <coughs> Praying to the dead is close to being doyer shalom That's what the Chayyadam tells us. And this is codified halach lamaisa in the Mishnah Brura. There are only two ways to daven at a kever. Number one, it's a holy place. Number two, you're davening to God in the merit of the tzaddik. So we'll hold them in next time because they're kind of in Let's see, let's see. Rabbi Sai, everything we've said so far sounds correct. That's what the Paiskim say. You're not allowed to pray to the dead directly. And yet, if you look in the Gemara, the Gemara has a very interesting account of what happened when Kalev ben Yifune went to the Mara Samachpel. The Gemara Masech the Soita and Aflam Adon of the number six. The Gemara says like this: Vayalu ba Negev, Kalev went up to the south. Vayavo yad Chevron, he comes to Chevron. Says the Gemara, Vayavo yumi boyle. It should say all the Meraglim came to Chevron. Amar Rava. We learn from here. Kalev separated himself from the Meraglim. He went to the graves of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He says to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, My fathers, Pray for me. That I should be spared from the council of the Miraglim. The Gemara doesn't say, Kalev said, let me go to a holy place. The Gemara doesn't say, Kalev said, God, save me in the merit of Abraham, right? Kalev didn't say, right? He said, Abraham, daven for me. Yitzchak, daven for me. Yaakov, daven for me. This is not like the Bach. Not like the Berhetev, not like the Chayadah, but not like the Mishabura. So even though all the Paiskim say you can't daven directly to the mace, but you look at the simple words of the Gemara, that's what Kalev was doing. So by the way, Taisus asks on the spot, whether you're allowed to daven or you're not allowed to daven, why would Kalev daven to Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov? They're dead. Now this may come as a surprise. The dead don't know what's going on in this world, Taisa says. Taisa says the dead, they're in a different world. It's not like, you know, they're sitting there with like special telescopes or, you know, looking down, where are you going, what are you doing tonight, how many slices did you eat, right? They're not, they're not, they don't know what's going on in this world. Taisa says, yes, there is one way for the dead to know what's going on in this world. And that is, if you pray to Hashem that you need something, then they notify the mace that you have that need. Fine. Okay, it's an interesting piece of information that Tosus is telling us. That it's not like the dead are, you know, sitting here, you know, looking at us, seeing... They don't know what's going on in this world. Unless somebody tells them. Why would anyone tell them? Only if you pray. That's what Tosus says. Well, we're going to talk about that further. So our question is, all the Pais can say that... At most, the only thing you could do at a kever is daven in the schus of the tzaddik. Some even go as so far to say, no, a kever is just like a holy place. And yet, Kalei ben Yifune says openly, Avoisai, my fathers, Bakshu olai rachamim, pray for me. Furthermore, the Gemara Antinus says, now let's say it didn't rain in a very long time. So what do you do? You go out to the cemetery. Why do you go to the cemetery? So one explanation is we're telling God, God, if you don't give us rain, we're like dead people. 
And another pshat is, Kedei sheyevakshu aleinu meisim rachamim, so that the dead should pray for us. The Gemara says that on a tiniest you should go to the cemetery so that the dead should pray for you. So doesn't that seem to say, you're not just davening in a holy place. You're not just davening in the merit of the tzaddik. You're davening to the mace that the mace should daven for you. And in fact, you have an open Gemara Masech Tainis, right? We gave Shia on this on Monday, that the Gemara says that there was a man by the name of Rav Mani. By the way, I'll tell you an interesting Misa. Rav Mani, he was married, and after a while, you know, uh, he says to his Rebbe, I married my wife 30 years ago. She was beautiful then. She doesn't look the same 30 years later. So Rabbi Yitzchak ben Yashiv says, Rabbi Yitzchak ben Yashiv says, what's her name? He says, Chana. So Chana Tesiapi. Chana should become beautiful again. The The next day, Chana was the most beautiful woman in the world. He comes back to the Rebbe the next day. He says, now that my wife's beautiful, she wants new clothing, new shoes. She asked me for the credit card. I can't take it. Maybe there was, yeah. <laughs> so he said, Chana should be back to her old self. Then the next day, he had problems with his brother in laws. The brother in laws were very wealthy, very rich. They come over to me. You know, a guy like you, you're wearing, say, you're, you're wearing a tie like that, you're wearing a suit like that, you drive a car like that. It's not uh, fit for a family like us. You have to drive a nicer car. They're putting too much pressure on him. So he says to the Rebbe, Rebbe, I can't take it anymore. They're too wealthy. So the Rebbe said, what's her name? Yankel and Beryl. Yankel and Beryl should become poor. Yeah. So he comes back to the Rebbe the next day, but now they're collecting tzedakah from me. I can't take it. <laughs> so he said, okay, let them have their money back. Then the Gemara says like this. Rev Money was having a problem. So with the Exilarch, with the house of the Nasi. So he went and he uh, went to pray at the uh, kever of his father. He said, Abba, Abba, Tata, Tata. These people are bothering me. So the father said, no problem. He sticks his hand out of the grave. He grabs a hold of the governor as he's passing by. And he would not let go of the guy's foot until the governor said, okay, I'm not going to touch your son anymore. So here we have three open gemaras that say when you go to a grave, it's not a holy place. You're not davening in the merit of the tzaddik. You're davening directly to the dead person. Kali ben Yifuna says, look in Saita Lama Dawa Nome Beis, Avoisai Bakshu Alai Rachamim, Tainus Chav Gimel. He said, Abba, Abba, Hani Mitzarule. He's davening straight to his father. So very nice, the place can say you can't do it, but the Gemara seems to say you can do it. And Rabbi Sai, furthermore, not only does the Gemara say you could do it, there are place can that say you could do it. The Prima Gadim, Brings down, look at number 16, in Simon, Tav Kuf Pei Aleph. The Primagodim says, Uve Siddur Man There's a Siddur called the Man I have a copy right over here. Yesh Tfilois Mashaimrim Alakvarim. There are prayers that you say at a grave. Mash Maktsas, that those Tfilos imply slightly. Shemevakshim Me'es Hanefesh that you're allowed to pray for the soul, that they should be a good intermediary on your behalf. So the Prima Gautam is saying that there is a Siddur called Man El right over here, you can get in your local bookstore, that if you look through the Tfilos in this Siddur, anybody ever see this Man El You go to, you know, your Zedas, that's when they went to the base of they took out the Man El The Man El what? Uh. Now I'll give you an example Look at number 15 We have a tefillah over here What should a person do? He's making a simcha And he's worried, you know uh, my, Last night I went to a wedding My brother-in-law got married People make a simcha They go to the Beis Salem They go to the Beis Akvaris Why? So people are worried of Ayin Hara they're, You know, they're going to be walking down the aisle And everyone's going to be looking at them What are they wearing? What are they, you know how much money do they spend on the chasana? Everyone's looking, everyone's looking. They're afraid of Ayin Hara. So here, you have a special tefillah to say when you go to a grave. It says like this. Tzadike yesoy de olam amudav. You're praying to the tzaddik. You're saying, you righteous people, pillars of the world. Meshar sekel avadav, Servants of God. Yehi shalom minu Rest in peace. Rest in peace, right? When the cars are driving by and they're honking. Relax, don't worry. Don't get stressed out over it. Yeah, I was once driving to a, a Lavaya, and we were driving two ladies, two older ladies in the back seat. So one lady said, you know, 
I don't want to be buried in this cemetery. It's right on the highway. It's a little bit too noisy. <laughs> so the other one said, you know, when you're down in the ground, you don't really hear the noise. You know? Anyway, so the first thing we say is, rest in peace, rest in peace. I've come to pray to you. Please intercede on my behalf. Don't be tired. Don't worry. Run. To beseech the merciful one. To protect us. So you tell me, does this sound like it's fila to God? God, I'm here in a holy place, please answer me. Does it sound like you're praying in the merit of the tzaddik? Of course not. You're openly praying to the dead. So on the one hand, all the paiskim, the bach, the berhetev, the chayodam, the mishabura say, you can't daven to the dead. It might even be an Isra Dairaisa. And on the other hand, you have open Gemaras that say, Kalei ben Yifune, where that was davening to Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. So how do you deal with this? So this question was raised by the Maharam Shik, Maharam Shik in number 14, in our Chaim Simen Reish Tzadi Gimel. And the Maharam, Maharam Shik says like this, We know the Chayodam says he can't do it. The Berhete, the Mishnah Brura, the Bach, I, the Gemara says, Kolei ben Yifune, pray to Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, says the Maram Shik in the name of the Yushalmi, Ein lemeidin min hohagados. There's a very important rule that you cannot learn halacha from Agadatah Gemara. About one-sixth of Shas is Agadatah Gemara. It's what we call the moral, ethical parts of Shas. Stories, incidents, and we learn a lot from it. We learn behavior, we learn musr, we learn good character. But one thing you can't learn is you can't learn halacha from Agadata. So the fact that the Gemara says that Kalei ben Yifune, Davin Tavra Mitzvah and Yaakov, beautiful! But you can't emulate that, you can't do it. It doesn't matter what the Gemara says he did. It's not a halachic Gemara. If the Gemara would be in a Mishnah, or the Gemara would be saying in halacha, Mutter l'hispala l'mesim, then you follow it. But this is not a shmaitza. It's not a halachic gemara. It's agadatah gemara. You cannot learn halacha from agadatah gemara. It's an important rule. Then the person, you know, learns a story in the gemara and they say, oh, I learned the story in the gemara, I'm going to follow that. No. If it's a matter of musr, if it's a matter of ethical behavior, you follow it. If it's a matter of halacha, you need to look at the paiskim. And the paiskim say you can't dive into the dead. Another explanation is like this. Take a look at number 19. <coughs> number 19. There was a man by the name of Rabbi Lezer ben Dordaya. Now, Rabbi Lezer ben Dordaya, he had a certain profession. He was Mazana with every single Zaina, every harlot in the world. Okay. That was his life. There was not one Zona in the whole world that he did not live with. One time he heard that overseas, far, far, far away, there was one Zona that he never uh, frequented. The only thing is, she took a big fee. So, he put together the money, and he's off. Not only that, it was a very difficult to get to her. He had to travel seven rivers, but nothing would stop him. He finally makes his way to the Zona, and in the course of the conversation, she blows something, and she says to him like this, the same way when I blew something, I can never take that blow back. If you sin with me, you will be a Russia forever. You will never be able to do tshuva. Whereupon, says the Gemara on the fifth line, he was so devastated by that comment. He went and he sat between two mountains, Ugvois and two hills. Omar, he said, Harim Ugvois Bakshualai Rachamim. Mountains, hills, pray for me. So they said, you want us to pray for you? We got to pray for ourselves. Because God said one day the mountains will all be destroyed. So he goes and he prays to the heavens. He says, heaven and earth, pray for me. So the heaven and earth says, pray for you. God told us one day we'll all dissipate. We need to pray for ourselves. He then turns to the sun and the moon. He says, sun and the moon, pray for me. They say, no, one day we're going to disappear. 
we have to pray for ourselves. Until finally, Rebbe Lezben Dordaya puts his head in between his knees and he cries so bitterly until his soul leaves his body, whereupon a baskal comes out from the heavens and says, Rebbe Lezben ben Dordaya mezuman l'chaye ha'olam abba. Rebbe Lezben ben Dordaya, he's going straight to heaven. Asks the Maram Sheikh, what in the world was Rebbe Lezben ben Dordaya saying to the mountains? Pray for me? Mountains can't pray. <coughs> they don't have a mouth. They don't have an art scroll sitter. How could they pray? <laughs> so what was Rebbe Lezer ben Dordaya saying to the mountains? He was telling the sun to pray. The sun doesn't pray. The moon doesn't pray. The answer is, he didn't really mean that they should pray. It's just an expression. It's a figure of speech. Says the, Mincha, says the Maram Sheik, Taira is what we call Aniyim b'makam echad v'ashirim b'makam echad. Kalev ben Yifune says, Avoisai bakshu alai rachamim. Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov daven for me. We don't know what Kalev meant. So we have to go to another Gemara where we find someone else daven to something inanimate. And over there it was clear Rav Lezben Dordai was not davening to the mountains. He wasn't davening to the hills. He wasn't davening to the sun. He wasn't davening to the moon. He wasn't davening to the earth. He was merely using a figure of speech that he is hopeless and helpless without God. So that's all Kali ben Yifuna meant. He didn't actually say, Abraham, wake up, wake up! I need your help! He didn't do that. He merely was saying to Hashem, Hashem, if you don't help me, I'm helpless. So, Chas Vesham says in Maram Sheikh, the Gemara is not a steer to the Halacha. The Halacha is you can't pray for the dead. I, the Gemara says, Kali address Aram Yitzchak and Yaakov. It's just a figurative language. It's just an expression of speech. However, says Maram Sheikh, this idea that if you dive into the dead, it's like being doyresh el amesim, it's like seeking out the dead, which is a lav in the Torah, says the Maram Sheikh, I don't agree with that. If a person would go to a cemetery and say, Beryl ben Shmerel, wake up, I need your help. Go up to God and pray for me. That would not be considered doyresh el amesim. Doyresh el amesim is only if you ask for the help of the body of the mace. But if you merely ask for the help of the soul of the mace, Halachically, that is not Doresh al However, says Maram Sheikh, what do we do with the Prima Gada? There is an entire Sefer called Man el with hundreds of Tfilais, what you pray to your sister, what you pray to your mother, what you pray to your brother, what you pray to your father, what you pray to your grandmother. So what do we do with this Sefer? So let me just tell you. The Mission Brew would say, take the Sefer, put it on your highest shelf, behind the Encyclopedia Britannica, and never take it out. That is what the Mishnah would say. That's what the Chayadim would say. And that's if you ask, you know, if you want to know halacha lemaisa, normative halacha, you can't dive into a mace. But there is such a safer, and there are thousands of Jews that are addressing their tools to a mace. So says Maram Shik, I have a big problem with that. And my problem with that is, Forget about Forget about seeking out the dead. It's a bigger problem. And that is you're violating the principle of the Rambam that you can't pray to an intermediary. We believe there's no such thing as you know, praying to someone who is going to take your tefillah and bring it up. We don't believe in that. That's a different religion. So since we believe a Jew is required to pray straight to God, how can this be understood on any level? So Maram Shik explains... That the fact, the fact is, there is a sefer called Man Alashem. It is quoted by the Prima Gadim. If you look in the Zayhar, the Zayhar is replete with references to people praying to the dead. If you look in the Sefer Hasidim, Sefer Hasidim is replete with the importance of praying to the dead. Now, I'm telling you right now, halachically speaking, if you want to ask, you ask, you know, a rabbi, what should you do, halacha, you shouldn't do it. But there is some basis for it, from the Sefer Hasidim, from the Zayar. Says the Maram Shik, I would explain it in the following way. Before God ever brings a difficult circumstance to a person, He has to weigh, should I bring this person this difficult circumstance? It's going to cause him distress. It's going to cause him tsar. Does he deserve the tsar? Does he not deserve the tsar? Fine. <clears throat> what if Hashem says, you know what? Yankul may deserve the tsar, but his wife doesn't deserve to be the tsar. So even though Yankel deserves to be in that situation, but since his wife is a tzaddikess, Hashem will not punish Yankel because he doesn't want Yankel's wife to suffer. 
or Yanko's children to suffer, or Yanko's friends to suffer. But what about Yanko's grandfather that's lying in the grave? Is a dead person distressed when their living relative is in pain? Says the Maram Shik, yes. The people in the Olam HaMS, who are related to us, have a certain degree of distress if they see that things are not going well for us. So says Maram Shik, all these tefillahs in the Man Elashem, you're not praying to the dead. You're not saying, Grazita help me, Tata help me. What you're saying is like this. You're praying, you're notifying them of your difficult circumstance. If once they know about your difficult circumstance, they're going to be distressed. God doesn't want them to be distressed. He may want you to be distressed. But not this tzaddik who's in the next world. So by you praying to them, it is not a prayer, it's not a tefillah, it's merely FYI. For your information, my dead relative, I want you to know that I'm not making as much money as I need to. Or my health, or my friend's health, or my... is not what it should be. So says Amar Amshik, the way I would understand this approach, which is, there's basis from it, from the Sefer Hasidim, and the Zayar, and others, and the Man Elashin, and the Prima Gadim, is that it's not a prayer, because a Jew may not pray to anyone but God Himself. Not even to someone, you can't even ask someone to carry your tefillah up to Shemayim. Maybe Yemir Hashem over Shabbos will discuss various tefillahs in uh, Slichos, where we pray to angels. We say, Machnisei Rachamim. Right? You should know. Many Gedalim say, you can to say that. Chassam Soifer himself would not say that tefillah. They ask Chassam Soifer, what do you do when everyone's saying Machnisei Rachamim? Chassam Soifer says, I made sure my Tachnon took extra long so I wouldn't get up to it. <laughs> it's a fact. Some stuff writes halach lemaisa. The Maral says you shouldn't say machnisei rachamim, hachnisu that you should. You're saying Hashem, God, tell the machnisei rachamim that they should bring it up. But you can't talk to the angels. Maral changes the gersa. Or for instance, shalom aleichem. Fine. You want to invite angels into your home? No problem. Invite them into your home. One thing Rabbi Yaakov Emden wants to know, could you tell me, you invite them into your home, and then three minutes later you say, get lost, go fly a kite, go jump in a lake, say Shem L'Shalayim. I mean, one thing, you want to let them have the gefilte fish, but you don't even serve the first course and they're already kicked out of the house. So Rabbi Yaakov Emden says, it's nonsense. He doesn't say it. He didn't say it. But even more problematic is, Barcheni, you're asking the angel to bless you? That's only heresy. That's all. You've only disabandoned your religion for saying that. So it's not so pashat. Not so pashat. You're asking someone else to give you, right? I can do that. So maybe we'll discuss that over Shabbos. Today we're talking about praying to humans, not to angels. We'll discuss that over Mirza Hashem Friday, Shabbos. But, says the Maram Sheik, Halacha The Paiskim say, you can't address anything at all to the mace. Others say, maybe the Mekubalim, the Hasidim, the Sefer Hasidim, the Zayar, that there is a concept of addressing to the mace, but it needs to be understood, and the justification the Maram Sheikh gives is that you're not praying, you're merely notifying them of your circumstances. What about the following situation? You have people, they go, uh, they go to the kever of a tzaddik, and they write on a little piece of paper, right? They take out this little piece of paper, Dear tzaddik, right? How's everything? <laughs> Send three dollars for now. You write, uh, they write a kvittal. Dear Tzaddik, help me out with this and this and this. How about Kotel? Kotel is a different story. We'll have to talk about that. Because with the Kotel, are you allowed to stick your finger into the Kotel or is that already part of the Harabayas? So that's, we'll have to discuss a different time. Mirz Hashem, looking forward to discussing that. One sec. But to go to a, 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 the, de- the kever of a Rebbe and to put on it Dear Rabbi, you know, I hope everything's good. Help me out with this and this. Whoa, what happened to God? You're not a, is that, is that a prayer to somebody? So says the Minchas Yitzchak, it's dependent on this question. If you're a follower of the Mishnah Bura and the Chayei Adam and the Paiskim, you can't, live a, you can't leave a settle on the grave of somebody. You've abandoned your God. The same way you can pray to someone who's not alive, it doesn't matter if you say it with words or if you write it on a piece of paper. So those who would like to consider themselves followers of the normative halacha, this would also be problematic. 
those who follow the approach of the Zayar and the Sefer Chassidim, so then they would have to understand that when they're writing on the piece of paper to the Rebbe, they're not praying to the Rebbe. They're, I, I mean, any Rebbe, right? You're not praying to this Rabbi. They are merely FYI, notifying the person, and this person who is a big tzaddik probably will be greatly distressed by your predicament, and that's all it is. Can you email Fox? <laughs> <laughs> the one in the South Queens allows that. <laughs> okay, so Rabbi Sai, that's very interesting, right? I think most people would say, yeah, of course you could leave it settle on a kever. Yeah, you can if that is your if that is your approach to this issue. Again, we're saying there are two approaches here. You know, in the Oilam HaYeshivos, where they follow the Mishnah Bura, they follow the Chayi Adam, so then the Minchas Yitzchak himself writes, this would not be allowed. So. But those who believe in some kind of justification for addressing the tefillah to someone who's not alive, and it's somehow explained that you're merely notifying them of your tsar. That would have to be the same explanation given for a piskos. So in Chas Yitzchak, you can look it up. In Chelek Ches, Simen Nun Gimel, he said, if you ask me, he's not going to stick his head into this age-old debate. But he's pointing out that the debate is dependent on the, the two ways of understanding what is happening at a grave. It's interesting to point out that he brings down from the Satmar Rebbe, right? Rabbi Yoilash. Rabbi Yoilash Satmar. So if I would ask you, what do you think the Samar Rebbe said about going to graves? So we would say, yeah, of course, the Hasidim are very into it. No. He said, no. The Samar Rebbe says, going to graves are only for big mikubalim who know the exact spiritual um, ramifications that are taking place, where you're bonding your soul to the soul in the grave. But if you have no idea what I just said, then you have no business in a graveyard. So how, That's how, what the Samar Rebbe writes in Al Gulav Atmura Ois Kovchas. I even saw it before I came here today. So nowadays it's pretty standard. It's understood. The Ramah even brings down. There's a minhag to go erev Yom Kippur, erev Rosh Hashanah. But for those simple Jews like me, follow the halacha. The halacha is giving us certain guidelines about what the approach should be. The approach should be: you understand it's a holy place. It's a makam kadosh. And if you want to pray in the zchus of the tzaddik, if you happen to have a specific tradition that your family, you know, going back, you have a tradition from the Zayar. Now, it's important to point out, what do you do, right? This is a classic instance when you have Paiskim against the Zayar. Who do you follow? Mishnah Bruce says you follow the Shas, you follow the, the Paiskim, yeah. Uh, with respect to, quote, prayers at the cemetery. Yeah. Uh, I saw in a few different Hamadric, the rabbi's manuals. Yeah. Basically, it says that basically all you can do is the kale male, and uh, <coughs> there are certain songs, okay, so not every single one, and I don't think you're allowed to use Hashem's name uh, in the cemetery. Well, so the, part of what we're learning today is that what it says in Sidurim, and in Kuntresim, and in Madrichim, we don't follow the halachas that they give. The halacha comes from the Paiskim and the Shulchan Aruch. The publishers or the printers are merely publishing and servicing what people want. Mm-hmm. So here we have the Mishabur is telling us what to do. Mishabur says, when you go there, you don't direct your attention toward the Mason. What's with these? I do want to point out that the Mincha Salazar, Salazar, who now is the founder of the Munkach, unless you want to go back all the way to the Menei Saskar. The Mincha Salazar is very pro going to graves. And he supports the opinion of the Zayar. And he says, not only is it allowed, it's a big mitzvah, and so forth. So, if that is your, uh, you know, for the sake of uh, completeness, we're going to mention his opinion. But again, what you have over here is you have the Paiskim, and you have what we call Sefer Chasidim and the Zayar. One last thing. One last thing. And that is. What about to go to a tzaddik? And the tzaddik is alive. So the person goes to the tzaddik, and he says, Tzaddik, help me out! I need a Yeshua, I need Parnas, I need health, I need Shaduchim, help me out! Is that a violation of what we're learning? Absolutely not. After all, you have a God. You have a God. Why are you praying to the tzaddik 
Why are you asking for the side to pray for, pray for yourself? No, you're going to him. No, you're so we know, we know that the Gemara advises us to do such a thing. The Gemara in Baba Basra and Dav Kuf Tezayinam and Aleph Darish or Pinchas ben Chama Kol Sheyesh Loi Choyla B'Tach Beisai Yelech Eitzah Chacham B'Yevake Shalav Rachamim Go to a Chacham. Again, it doesn't say go to a Tzadik. The Tzadik is not the first choice. The Chassid is not the first choice. It's the Talmud Chacham. You hear? The Talmud Chacham. And the Ramah Paskin Talach Lamaisa so what is the difference between why are we saying you can't ask a dead tzaddik to daven for you so why could you ask a living tzaddik what's the difference what's the difference so the maral says a very interesting line and I'll let you think about this the maral says like this when you go to a living tzaddik imagine you go to the house of a living tzaddik are you allowed to ask the tzaddik to give you a glass of water yes yeah. are you allowed to ask him to, you know, help you find a job. Yeah. So you could ask him to pray for you. You know why? Because you could ask him to do you a favor. There's something called chesed. A person who's alive could do chesed. But once the tzaddik is dead, there's no such thing as chesed anymore. There are no mitzvahs. Once you're in the next world, as righteous as you are, there's nothing more you could do. So says Maral, if the tzaddik is alive, you could ask him to pray. Aye, but the Ramam says, Shehu levade roi lespalo. You're just asking him for a favor. And Rav Moshe Feinstein even writes in a tshuva that this is encouraged. If somebody needs something, the best bet, go to a Talmud Chacham, not a Kabbalist, go to a Talmud Chacham and ask them to daven for you. But, but, Shal didn't do the right thing. But, yeah. but, but, says the Maral, to go to a living tzaddik, living tzaddik, you're asking for chesed. To go to a dead tzaddik, that's called being Doi Reshalam Mason. So this is an important thing to realize, that the concept of Tfilo by a kever, the source is in this week's parsha. but as we pointed out, the Paiskim warn us that there are certain very specific guidelines how it's done, and Baisai, the Ban Shem should be Mekab all of our Tfilo's Barachim and Baratzen. Have a good night. You've just experienced another Torah class, brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.